Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. I'm here and I'm showing the world that you can stay yourself and get respect from the world. There are many, many films about Muhammad Ali. We think we tell a story in a kind of complete way. This film, it's the whole picture. It's the good, the bad, it's the inspiring, it's everything. I am the greatest. I am drawn to boxing when the person and the bouts seem to reflect something larger. And the person who's doing the fighting is one of the most extraordinary human beings that I have ever, ever met. Boxing was his platform that he used to be able to change the world. He was a pioneer, he was a revolutionary, a guy known simply as the greatest. We talked to a lot of people interested in boxing and Muhammad Ali. Todd Boyd, Gerald Early, the uh, novelist, Walter Mosley, a scholar of Islam, Sherman Jackson, and we interviewed his family, his brother, Rachman, his daughter, Rashida, and another daughter, Hana. There was a clip where my dad was saying, you know how your daddy's greatest? Do you know your dad is the baddest man in the world? I've never seen that clip before, and I just had tears was rolling down my face. Maybe you'll come for the boxing, maybe you'll come for the religion, maybe you'll come for the politics or the conflict. But I think you leave with an elevated sense of an amazing American. To have that chutzpah and to be a black man in America was just, it was outlandish. Oh, I'm so pretty. Baby. I shook up the world. Muhammad Ali, only on PBS. Hello and welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Morneau. 25 years ago, legendary boxer Muhammad Ali lit the Olympic flame in Atlanta to kick off the Summer Games. In that iconic moment, the world was reminded that Muhammad Ali was more than a gold medal winner and three-time heavyweight champion of the world. He was someone that transcended his sport and remains an inspiration to millions around the world, even after his death in 2016. A new four-part documentary, Muhammad Ali by Ken Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon premieres on PBS September 19th. Here to share more about the film is one of the great storytellers of our time, award-winning documentary filmmaker and producer, Ken Burns. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Burns. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, please call me Ken. Uh, it's, this is as exciting a project as I've ever worked on, and I'm here to represent both Sarah Burns and David McMahon, uh, at the co-directors in all of this. Well, I was able to preview the documentary this weekend, uh, really an in-depth story of not only his career, but his life, uh, Muhammad Ali's life. There's been so much work on Muhammad Ali done before, documentaries, films, uh, music albums. And I'd like to hear from you, what was it about his story in life that made you want to take this deep dive into it? Well, I'm glad you said that because there are lots of really good documentaries about Muhammad Ali and, and we're in awe of them and we love them. And we're, we're not suggesting in any way this is definitive. We're hoping that it's comprehensive. Most of them pick a single fight. Some of them pick, uh, you know, a couple of years, a battle with the United States. We wanted to do soup to nuts from boyhood in Jim Crow, Louisville, Kentucky to death by Parkinson's in 2016 and all of it, not just the boxing, which we wanted to do in detail and not skip any of the major fights and to come to terms and understand the strategy and the tactics and the psychology of it, but also his personal life, the four wives, the many children, uh, his family, early family life, his brother, his parents, uh, also his intersection with so many of the issues of the late 20th century in terms of race and politics and faith and all of the things we're arguing now and so it was our attempt to do a full-fledged biography of one of the most incredible Americans who's ever lived. 
Yeah, I'd like to start off with just his upbringing. How much of an influence do you think growing up in the Jim Crow South in Louisville, Kentucky, had on Muhammad Ali's uh, you know, understanding of the world and the world that he was growing up in and then went on to be a professional in? It's huge. I mean, all of us know the extent to which our own upbringing has influenced us and shaped us. Imagine being a young black kid in the middle of the 50s and seeing Emmett Till's tortured, mutilated body in an open cact uh, you know, casket in Jet magazine and hearing your father rail against the injustices. His father was a real race man uh, and had felt that the color of his skin had kept him from being the painter, the artist that he was, that it was really about, um, you know, he was forced to be a sign painter, which is beneath his dignity. And so he always felt that this kid who was always loud, speaking before, you know, like he was one year old, banging pots and pans, wanted to be seen, wanted to be heard, funny, uh, gregarious and and stumbles into boxing as a, as a profession accidentally um, is going to sort of carry all of those things good and bad with him having to look through a chain like fence as the white kids of Louisville got to play at an amusement park and he and his friends weren't allowed to go there uh, it's 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 shaping and I think in ways that the African-American experience doesn't always translate uh, to the rest of us. We're blind to some of the injustices that are a kind of daily, hourly occurrence. And he's, that's going to form uh, Cassius Clay and later Muhammad Ali. Now, early in his career, he was telling people how good he was. I mean, he was obviously a gold medal winner in Rome in the 1960 Olympics, went on to have a great start in his, in his heavyweight career as, as a professional. And I'd like to hear from you, what was it that kind of caught people off guard about his charisma and confidence that, you know, we're, we may be used to today, but during that time, it was something completely new and different. Everybody expected from their uh, their athletes and anybody a kind of modesty, which he did not have. And way before Rome, when he won the gold medal, he was telling everybody he was going to be the greatest. There was nothing actually in his amateur to career heretofore that would in any way suggest that that was possible. And yet he knew, somehow he knew he had a larger purpose in life. And if boxing was going to be the way to spread that gospel, then that's what it was going to be. And so he bursts on the scene as something very shocking. The self-confidence translates into dis-ease for a lot of white Americans and a lot of uh, black Americans who are worried that he's just too uh, braggadocio, there's too much self-confidence, that he's not behaving the way he should. And, and so there are a lot of people who turned off from it, but really hoping that Liston will shut him up, as they say. And it doesn't happen in the 64 championship fight when he defeats Sonny Liston in Miami. And then he goes on, it's even louder, it's even bigger. And he's kind of redefining black manhood for a new generation. If Jackie Robinson, a subject of a film we made, is 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 the earlier generations and this is your new version your 2.0 it's Muhammad Ali now he's joined a different religion it's making not just white people but black people uncomfortable too because most of the civil rights movement is based on integration and out of a southern Christian leadership kind of uh, direction and he's not that he's northern and he's separatist uh, supposedly and uh, it's very complicated it's very threatening to a lot of people in the United States and then on top of that insult to injury he decides to take a stand against the Vietnam War and refuse induction into sir into the US Army into service and he's convicted and is has three and a half years of the peak of his career taken away by this time he is the most divisive person in American sports and and people just hate him and are always rooting for his competitor not because it's it's uh, they like the competitor because they want him to lose and the thing is he's not losing and when he comes back finally after the Supreme Court unanimously exonerates him on a technicality he loses his fight the principal fight wins the first two but loses his principal fight to Joe Frazier for the heavyweight championship and all of a sudden things begin to change people realize he was right about Vietnam people realize that he got up when he was floored by by uh, Frazier got right back up into the fight so they're seeing a different guy he's humble afterwards and he's never gonna lose the braggadocio in leading up to any fight but he's now somebody that can be a hero to the rest of us yeah I, I think today we we revere him you see people wearing shirts with his name 
all over the place, uh, you know, and his, his uh, fame is something that lives beyond his death. But one thing that really reminded me uh, with this film was it reminded me of how polarizing a figure he was during that time. Yes. Uh, you know, that's something that I think um, maybe our generations today may not be aware of, but they're able to really discover that. You really dove in and, and, uh, and really showed how uh, the sports writers at the time and journalists were covering him in a certain way. Um, there was only a select few who were even calling him by Muhammad Ali after yes. he changed his name. A lot of other fighters were sort of ridiculing him for this. The Illinois Athletic Commission keeps saying, Mr. Clay, Mr. Clay, and he's going, Muhammad Ali, sir, Muhammad Ali, sir, Muhammad Ali. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to think, particularly in a day of outspoken uh, athletes, that there was somebody who not only was more outspoken, but risked everything and lost everything. To his mind, he was out and he wasn't going to back down. He knew, everybody knew, that if he'd in, accepted induction, he'd got a cushy job doing touring bases, a kind of Elvis Presley uh, sort of thing. Yeah, and, similar and, to and what Joe would, Lewis had or something. Yeah, yeah and Joe Lewis had, it wouldn't, he wouldn't be in danger, and yet he stood on principle. This is an amazing thing. And so that's why it was important for us in the course of the film Film to remind people of just how divisive he was. A few people got it. Howard Cosell got it earlier than most and understood the extent to which he, Muhammad Ali, was an avatar of a new kind of American. Not just a black American, but a new kind of American. And so that by the time that the Olympic torch happens, where he's shaking visibly from the Parkinson's that has overtaken his body, to, and his death, as let's, let's cut to the chase, he died the most beloved person on the planet, which is not a bad thing to die. That's a really, that's a good life well lived. And yet we have to tell all the ins and outs of it, all the undertow, all of his flaws, and there are many, and nobody's perfect. And, and so I think there's something we expect a kind of falseness out of our heroes to be perfect. Muhammad Ali reminds us that that's not the case, but you can get pretty far. Uh, working on himself, and he did all his life. And in fact, remember what M Michael J. Fox said after Parkinson's overtook him? He said, I couldn't be still until I couldn't be still, meaning yeah. the shake. And with Muhammad Ali, he couldn't really speak. For all the speaking he did, he couldn't really speak until he couldn't speak. And then he was this magnificent example, um, transcendent, almost religious um, presence, spiritual presence for the rest of the world. Uh, David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, says in the film, like, the Buddha. And, and, you, and you realize the extent to which uh, that was true. There was a kind of inner peace that began to overtake him. And so we now look back at him as, as one of the greatest Americans that's ever lived, forgetting, unfortunately, how divisive and how complicated that story is. And that's why we really wanted to tell it, to be able to say, warts and all, here's this guy. We mm -hmm. love him. You know, I mean, I've never come across anybody quite like him in my entire professional life. Growing up, what did you think of Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, as because you're from a, a similar generation, a baby boom yeah, generation. No, I, so. my, my, my dad and I watched the Rome Olympics, watched him win, very proud, then kind of got uncomfortable by the braggadocio le leading up to the 64 Liston fight. We're kind of for Liston, I guess, if we were into boxing. We weren't into boxing. Boxing was not a good sport. But you were interested in someone, something like this, because it seemed to be clashes not just between two people in a sport, but of, of developing ideologies. And then almost immediately after he won, though I have to admit, I think that we were for Liston, that um, we began to love him. And then, of course, our own opposition to the Vietnam War meant that we didn't he didn't lose us in that. I think there was a little bit of worry that he wasn't following the path of Dr. King, that the Nation of Islam was had some aspects of separatism that just seemed discordant and were a bit scary. But for the most part, we embraced him and loved him and believed that he could have his faith. So all of my life, I met him once at a, at a, at a, uh, a coffee shop uh, in, in L.A., wordless conversation between the two of us in a near-empty coffee shop that I'll remember for the rest of my life for the fact that it didn't need words expressed in order to 
have a, a, a lot of a, a conversation between us. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was important though as we retold it not to just sanitize it and make it a kind of Madison Avenue celebration. There's lots of dimension. There's lots of complexity. There's lots of controversy. There's lots of undertow that goes along with all this majesty, with all this athletic uh, grace and, and excellence. And, and you got to tell all of that story. Yeah, it seems like even when you look back at old interviews with Muhammad Ali, he's very open and honest about a lot of things Everything. that are happening in Everything. his life, which you don't really see from athletes today, especially star athletes who are very concerned about their brand and yep. how they're portrayed and, and how it's going to affect, um, you know, their, their, you know, so-called brand and um, status in, in Only the world. Colin Kaepernick has had any kind of, you know, now I won't even say comparable, but similar types of problem. But, you know, there are many outspoken athletes, but if they were to, if they were to know they're about to lose all their source of income and three and a half years of their career, would they be still holding this same thing? I don't know. Maybe so. Uh, but, but the society hasn't tested them quite in that way, the way they've tested Colin Kaepernick, who's come out smelling like a rose. He was doing what he believed. And Muhammad Ali was doing that just a couple generations before that. Now, you've been well known as uh, producing these documentaries that are in depth. Uh, they may be multiple episodes. This, epi this uh, documentary is four episodes in depth. Do you think that there's going to be a change with our viewing habits as we get used to um, on demand streaming and, and things like that? How, do you think it's going to affect the future of documentary? Filmmaking. Yeah, and, and I think, it, yes, uh, and I think in a really good way. I mean, it, when the Civil War was about to come out, my series on the Civil War in 1990, everybody said, oh, Ken, this is so good, but no one's going to watch 12 hours of still photographs. They're, everybody's stuck in MTV videos, right? And they said that about baseball, and they said that about jazz. They said it about our film on World War II and the national parks. But they didn't say it about the Roosevelts that came out in 2014 or Vietnam or country music, or any of the other smaller mini-series that we've done, like Muhammad Ali and upcoming projects that we're working on right now. Because, um, first of all, everybody will go to something that's good, you know? Mm -hmm. And we've always gotten, you know, tens of millions of people for those long-form things when everybody was supposed not to be interested in them. But also, I think the streaming habits gives us a certain amount of freedom, the thing that Muhammad Ali wanted. You know, there's a tsunami of information and stuff and programming, and to be able to just say, ah, oh, I want to watch that, and to focus on that is a really a great, great thing. And so we're finding the streaming numbers are just rising exponentially each major series. And the other key ingredient secret for me is public broadcasting. You know, I, I, I could go to a streaming service or a premium channel and get the money I needed to do Vietnam or Muhammad Ali or country music, but they're not going to give me 10 and a half years that they gave me for, that PBS gave me for, ten, for, for Vietnam or nine years for country music or seven for this. They, they want it, it's a marketplace. They want it on demand, but we can't do the deep dives. We can't find those still photographs which you've never seen before. You can't find those film clips of his reflectiveness at age 19 or 20 or 21. That, that we were able to find. You're not going to find the footage that Rashida, his daughter, made cry because she'd never seen him talking to her. You know, he's holding her as a little baby and saying, don't you know your daddy's the baddest person? She'd never seen that wept, uh, you know, like the baby she was in the footage. That's the hallmark of our being able to do it and learning new information, being willing to change the script as you learn it, learning that things were more complicated than our conventional wisdom and then changing the film to reflect that complexity. People are people get it. Everybody they know, everybody you know, everybody I know is complex. Yeah. And they're flawed and, and so is Muhammad Ali. Well, you, I mean, his life, is his career really takes off at a time in the 1960s where we're having this uh, big dialogue on race, which we're still having today. Still having. And I, I kind of wanted to hear from you as somebody that's a successful filmmaker, um, you know, in the industry, the filmmaking industry in itself has been criticized for not being diverse enough. PBS yeah. has been criticized for not having yeah. enough diverse filmmakers. You're somebody that has a pretty big voice in the industry. What do you think filmmakers like you and those in charge need to consider when they're telling these stories of 
of diverse people and um, of different races and cultures in the United States or across the world. What are some things that you've learned or what, you, what, what are some things that you're conscious of now that maybe you weren't before? Well, one of the reasons I've worked with public television is it's been better than any other place in terms of diversity and inclusion and uh, giving people of color and other filmmakers opportunities. Can, can they do more? Of course. Can we all do more? Now, you're looking at me as a representative of a film project in which three of the four editors of the four episodes were people of color, so were significant other parts of our crew. Most of the on-camera people were African-American. Um, so we, we, and that's the way we've rolled. We, we don't talk about subjects unless we can find people who know the best part about them. It might be the biographer Jonathan Igue, who happens to be white, or it might be Gerald Early, who's been in four or five of our films, uh, who is a historian and writer uh, about sports particularly, who's been in baseball, who's been in Jackie Robinson, who's been in our update of the baseball series, who's been in this, um, and lots of people there. So we're very mindful of it. And I think as a whole, everybody can do better. Everybody can listen more to the other and everybody can be much more inclusive in the way they tell the stories. I mean, my whole argument has been is I've been telling a very complex story. People have been yelling at me for decades about too much race in my films, you know? And I'm yeah. going, sorry, this is the story of us. Yeah, well, I want to talk with you a little bit more about, you know, these times and obviously it's, there's a lot of uh, complex issues we're facing right now, whether it's dealing with race, whether it's dealing with the divisions in our country, or of course the pandemic and, and how that intersects with everything. I, I'd like to hear from you as somebody who studied American history so much, what are your thoughts on where we're at right now and how concerned should we be? Because you just got finished uh, you know, with this documentary of the 1960s, a very turbulent time in, in the United States. Uh, how do you compare this time we're living in right now to that time? I think one of the reasons why Muhammad Ali speaks to us so clearly is because most of the uh, themes that his life at the second half of the 20th century intersected with are still happening. I mean, human nature doesn't change, so we're still, unfortunately, trying to figure out this, um, to have a, a racial reckoning to try to figure out how to do this. We're dealing with the virus of that, the virus of misinformation and conspiracy and 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 uh, misleading things. We're also dealing with a, a virus which has given us a, a huge existential threat. So all of these things are kind of focused together. The one thing that's most disturbing is this idea that we would limit history, that we'd sanitize it. You know, in Texas is talking about you can only teach a certain sanitized version of it. Seems funny because the real religion of Texas is football. And on a Friday night, the high school coach or Saturday afternoon, the football coach said, we really stunk. We were terrible on defense. We were terrible on offense. We're looking for the truth. The champions always know what they can do better. That's always, I was always surprised that whenever Tom Brady won a game, he'd say, well, you know, I'm still not satisfied with this, that, or that. Belichick would do the same thing. Why is it so hard in the country that people say is the greatest on earth to be tougher on ourselves than anybody else's because we want to be the best. We want to live up to that ex exceptional status, which means we need to tell everything, warts and all. And the idea that we would be limiting that, you can't talk about slavery anymore, you can't say anything bad about people who owned slaves, or you can't, the institution of slavery, all, all of that limiting stuff is, is a, a detriment. It's a hallmark of a Soviet system of government, not a democratic one. How are your thoughts on the way we're handling social media right now during this time of, you know, such division? Um, what are your thoughts on uh, social media and how they're handling, uh, you know, censorship? Um, well, we saw your thoughts. It, 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 you know, social media isn't. Let's just get that straight. It's not social. It's individual. And it's permitted people to only hear one thing. And that means that the marketplace of ideas, which was central to our founders, that's what they meant by the pursuit of happiness, was not the pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things. It was the pursuit of ideas in a marketplace of thoughts, of, of feelings. And people subscribe to newspapers all up and down the colonies uh, listening to different points of view. People don't get that. They self-select. And what that does is it permits the disinformation, the conspiracies, the, the kind of cuckoo thinking to, to take hold as, as if it's mainstream. I mean, when you have a, a, a representative of the United States Congress applauding the low vaccination rate in Alabama, 
yeah. you, you you understand that these these instruments are wholly injurious to us and whatever benefit comes from being able to see your grandchildren's photographs in two seconds are are completely offset by the pernicious nature that foreign players can play a part in our elections that people can promote the craziest of ideas and they become mainstream or semi mainstream you know my, my I'm a dinosaur in this regard uh, I, I just say go back, read read one or two of the great papers. There's a conservative one, the Wall Street Journal. There's a fairly liberal one, moderate one, called the New York Times. Washington Post will qualify. Do that. Watch a national broadcast of the nightly news, and then stay away from everything else. I have been making films, Anthony, about the U.S. for almost 50 years. I've also been making films about us. That is to say, the two-letter, lowercase, plural pronoun. and all of the intimacy of us and we and our and all of the majesty, the complexity, the contradiction and the controversy of the U.S. And what I've learned in all of those nearly 50 years is that there's only us. There's no them. And when somebody tells you there's a them, run away. Ken Burns is the director and producer of the new documentary, Muhammad Ali, which premieres on PBS September 19th. I want to thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Anthony Murnau. We'll see you next time. He was bigger than boxing. I am the greatest. He was larger than life. His magnetism just was amazing. Who is this guy? He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. And ain't nobody gonna stop me. Ken Burns captures an intimate story of victory, defeat, and determination. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Muhammad Ali, 